All right, welcome back everybody. Today we're gonna be moving on to chapter 10, talking about some parametric curves. Uh, and good news is this is a bit of a shorter lesson, so it won't be as long as 8.3 with all those engineering and physics applications. Um, we also get to see a whole bunch of really pretty pictures, and that's always nice. All right, let me go ahead and pull up the slide, the slides, excuse me, and I'll get started. Okay, so these are curves defined by parametric equations. Uh, one note I'll give now is we actually skip chapter nine. Chapter nine is all about differential equations, and we've got a whole course on differential equations. So we'll save all of that content until that course instead, all right? Uh, so here's the overview. We're gonna get a motivation for why we care about such curves. We will get a definition, and then the rest is just examples. Um, we're gonna pull up Desmos, and we're gonna look at a whole bunch of different Desmos examples. You are welcome to play around with those Desmos examples and do all sorts of stuff and just investigate, and I encourage you to. So let's get started. Now, here's the, here's the motivation. So there are a lot of functions out there and a lot of curves out there that we want to describe that cannot be written as a function of x. So in other words, if you imagine like the plane, R2, there are a whole bunch of curves, all sorts of crazy curve-like things that we would like to talk about. Uh, the problem is you can't write them as functions of x, or at least uh, it can be very, very, very painful to try to write them as functions of x. Um, oftentimes you'll have to decompose it into a hundred or more hundreds, thousands of little individual functions of x, and that's not really that practical. Um, remember that only curves that pass the vertical line test can be written as functions of x. So for example, this curve up here, you can't write it as a single function of x. What you could do is you could decompose it into a whole bunch of single functions of x, but again, very, very tedious. Oh yeah, like I'm saying right here. Um, there's also many curves that are difficult or painful to describe using Cartesian coordinates. So a lot of times you don't wanna to have to write something in terms of x's and y's because the structure of it doesn't quite lend itself to x's and y's. We'll see, we'll see. You'll see what I mean in just a few minutes. So what we're gonna do is this. Rather than describe the vertical change of a curve in terms of its horizontal change, so in other words, rather than write the vertical change as a function of the horizontal change, we're gonna describe both the horizontal and the vertical change in terms of a third variable called a parameter. So we're gonna introduce another variable and that variable is going to let us distinguish between what's happening in the x direction and what's happening in the y direction, all right? So here's the definition. Suppose that x and y are both given as functions of a third variable t. So in other words, we're gonna say that x is some function of t and y is some function of t. Then these are what are called parametric equations and t is what we call the parameter. And each value of t determines a point in the plane. So this is kind of the, that's kind of the takeaway right there. What is x and what is y? It's the output of those two individual functions. So we're describing the horizontal displacement or horizontal position and the vertical position in different, using different functions, all right? So curves that are defined this way are called parametric curves. And this pair right here is called a parameterization of the given curve, a parameterization of it. Uh, a good intuitive interpretation is that uh, this point gives you the position of an object at time t. So that's one of the reasons we like to use t. It's not necessary to use t, may not always be the best to use t, but a lot of times we use t because it's like, hey, at time t, where is the particle? Oh, it's at this coordinate, or I'm sorry, it's at this point, x of t, y of t. Okay, now at this other time t, where is the point? Oh, it's at x of t, y of t for this new value of t. All right, so you can think of it as this is telling you where the object is at time t and where it, how it moves horizontally might be very different from how it moves vertically. And we wanna differentiate between those two things. Okay, so um, nice kind of recovery here is that the typical Cartesian curve of a function, you can interpret it as a parametric curve. So all the functions you've been working with, functions of x, functions of y, those are also considered parametric curves or parametric curves. It's just in those cases, the parameter is one of the other functions. 
So we could say x equals x and write y equals f of x, then we get the point x comma f of x. This is basically what you've been working with for the majority of your math education, right? So you put in an input x and you get out an output f of x and you associate y with f of x. This is still a parametric curve. It's just that your first parametric equation is kind of a trivial one. You're just saying that the, the position in terms of x is just given by x. That's why you get this. Uh, you've also seen this in terms of y's. So you've seen a function where y was the input variable and x was the output variable. Same thing here. y is the input variable. f of y is the output variable. And we're associating that with x. So the concept of a parametric curve or curves described by parametric equations is a generalization of something that you've already seen in the past. And now we have more flexibility. So what's nice is this. Param uh, planar curves that are defined by parametric equations of a third variable like t, they actually give you more information. In particular, they encode the position of a point at some time, at some time. Why is this handy? Because now this gives a, uh, this gives a directionality to our curves. So we can use arrows to indicate how the curve is being produced over time. So it's like, oh, at this time, the particle is here. And then at this other time, the particle is here. And then at this other time, the particle is here. And then we can say that as time passes, this is how the curve is generated. So when you describe these things in terms of a third variable, a third variable, a parameter, you get more information, which is kind of cool. So um, what else did I say down here? Oh yeah, same kind of thing as before. So parametric equations allow us to describe the horizontal behavior and the vertical behavior separately in terms of, an, of, of independent functions. All right, so let's try this example. We're going to sketch and identify the curve given by these parametric equations. And for now, we're going to use a table. So I'm actually going to have you do this on your own first. But let me point out what's happening. Uh, here, the x coordinate is given by this function of t. And the y coordinate is given by this function of t. So what you're going to do is you're going to plug in some values for t and then compute what the x coordinate and the y coordinates are going to be and then plot those points. All right. So let me throw up the thinker for a minute. So think about what I was just saying for a minute. Right now, say something out loud to yourself about how you could begin. What's a good place to start? All right now, calculate. Try to uh, come up with a few points. Um, pick values of t like negative uh, 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and see what you get. All right, now let's do it together. Here we go. So just picking some values for t, uh, in this case, we used uh, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, just picking these values of t and plugging them in for x and plugging, I'm sorry, plugging them in to our x equation and plugging them into our y equation, we can generate this table of coordinates. So when t is negative 2, x is 8, and y is negative 1. So this gives us the point, this gives us the point 8 comma negative 1. Then when t is equal to negative 1, x is 3 and y is 0. So we get the point 3 comma 0. And then we can proceed like so, right? When t is 0, x becomes 0 and y becomes 1. So we get another point, 0 comma 1. So what this is telling you is that as t goes from negative two to four, this is giving you the locations of the point, the point that's determined by these two parametric equations. So when you generate a few of these points and then you plot these points, this is the picture that you get. All right, that's the picture you get. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Ah, there we go. So some things to point out. Uh, for one, it is parabolic. It looks like a parabola. Notice the arrows. So because we're using a third parameter, we get a directionality to our curve. So we can actually describe how the curve is produced over time. So it basically goes like this. 
That's what's happening. And each point on this curve corresponds to one of the parameters t, right? So here, I think the point we got was 8, comma, negative 1. Let me go back. Was it 8, negative 1? Yeah, 8, negative 1. So this is the point 8, negative 1. Maybe I'll move it a little closer. There we go. And then the next point we got was, oh, geez, I forget. I guess it's, um, oh, I forgot. What is it? Uh, 3, comma, 0. So this is the point 3, comma, 0. And then the next point is 0, comma, 1. 0, comma, 1. And so as time progresses, that curve gets traced out like so. All right. Now, some other things to notice. Um, I mentioned the first bit over here already, the first bullet point. We can see the that, that, that. <laughs> we can see the trajectory of the curve as t increases, which is nice, right? Uh, we can also observe this, and this is where there's a bit of intuition coming in, a bit of intuition involved, and you'll expound upon this in Calc 3. Uh, the behavior in the y direction is linear. It's given by a linear function t plus 1 is just a linear function. It's, it's a line. And that's why the behavior in the y direction is just linear in nature. There's no weird like ups and downs. There's no like reversing or anything like that. It's literally just proceeding linearly, right? Now, the behavior in the x direction is parabolic. So the behavior in the, the, the x direction is defined by this parabola, t squared minus 2t. And that's why if you look at the horizontal behavior, the horizontal behavior is parabolic. It's going like this, and then it's going like this, right? It goes you, you. So vertical behavior is linear in nature. Horizontal behavior is parabolic in nature. Sorry, I guess I should go this way. That's better. <laughs> so you can start to describe the, the behavior in the vertical and horizontal direction in all sorts of interesting ways, if you think about it, right? All sorts of interesting ways. Okay. Um, now, oh yeah, so now let's talk about eliminating the parameter. So sometimes you can actually eliminate the parameter given a pair of parametric equations. And that essentially means taking one of those equations and substituting it into the other one. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take this equation, solve it for t, and then take that result and plug it into this equation. So here we go. Uh, let's see. If we solve this for t, we get t equals y minus 1. So this becomes this when you solve for t. Now we're going to take y minus 1, and we're going to plug it into, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're going to take t equals y minus 1, and we're going to plug it in for these t's. And this is what we get. y minus 1 squared, 2 times y minus 1. And then when we simplify that, we get this formula here, y squared minus 4y plus 3. So here's the, here's the interesting, cool part. This is the equation of that parabola that was in the figure before. That's the equation of this parabola right here. If you want to derive it in terms of Cartesian coordinates, this is the formula for it, x equals y squared minus 4y plus 3. But notice that when we eliminate the parameter, and we only get it in terms of x's and y's, we've lost the information about the direction of the curve because the directionality or the direction of the curve is given by t. So if you eliminate the parameter t, you lose that information. You still are, you're still, you basically can see the, the path that the particle took, but you can't see where it was, where it was going at certain times. You just know that it went through that path. All right, so what is eliminating the parameter? That's just solving one parametric equation for the parameter, substituting that result into the other equation, and then simplifying. That's called eliminating the parameter. Okay, now another uh, uh, easy definition that we can add on here. Um, a lot of times we want to restrict the domain of the parameter to some interval from alpha to beta, so we can focus on local behavior. So if I flash back to that previous example here, uh, here there was no restriction on the values of t. So t could be any number from between negative infinity and positive infinity, right? There's no restriction on the parameter. A lot of times we do want to restrict the parameter. We don't want to let time go on forever. We want time to be bounded above and below. 
So we can do that by just restricting the parameter. So we have the same definition, but now we only let t vary between these two numbers, alpha and beta. Now, when you have this restriction, you can talk about the beginning and the end of the curve. <laughs> so at the beginning, we call that the initial point. So when t is equal to alpha, we get the initial point of the curve. And that point is given by this, these coordinates right there. So we're just taking alpha and plugging it into f, and taking alpha, plugging it into g. And so the initial point is f of alpha, g of alpha. That's where the curve starts, right? Now do the same thing for beta, and you'll get the terminal point. So the terminal point is where the curve stops, right? And that point is f of beta, g of beta. Now the point f of t, g of t traverses the curve, starting at the initial point and ending at the terminal point as t goes from alpha to beta. So not too bad. Basically, it's just saying, hey, if you've got bounds on t, then you can talk about where the curve begins and where the curve ends, and you can talk about going from here to there. That's the idea. All right. So these are a couple of examples that I want you to think about, and then we'll talk about them in just a moment. Moment. So this one, um, you don't have to write anything down, but you do have to say something out loud. What curve is represented by these parametric equations with that restriction? Go. Think about it and say it out loud. All right, hopefully they look very, very familiar to you because this is the unit circle. This is the good old unit circle. So X is given by cosine, Y is given by sine, and T goes from zero to two pi. That's the unit circle traversed once. And because we're using parametric equations, this actually gives us a directionality to the unit circle. Because when t is equal to zero, we start right here. So when t is equal to zero, the initial point is the point one comma zero. And then as t increases, you travel around the circle and then you end up at the same point at the end. So in this case, this is what we call a closed curve because what's happening here is the initial point and the terminal point coincide. So we get a closed curve. Now we can eliminate the parameter and this is gonna look very familiar as well. Um, X squared plus Y squared equals cosine squared plus sine squared, which is equal to one because that's the equation of the unit circle. So this is what the Cartesian equation of the unit circle. And so there you go. Once you eliminate the parameter, you eliminate all the, we always do this backward. You eliminate all the, ah, wait, maybe I could do it this way. No, ah, it's too hard to do it in reverse. No, this way, wait, yes, like that. There we go. <laughs> when you eliminate the parameter T, you don't see any of the quote unquote motion. All that you see is the circle. You just see like the actual circle that was constructed after T has been allowed to move around from zero to two pi. All right. Now think about this one, all right? Let me put this one up and I ask you the same question. What curve is represented by these equations? So think about it and they then say something out loud when you have an idea. <clears throat> all right, so <laughs> hopefully you thought about it for a minute and were able to come up with an idea, but this is actually still the unit circle. This is still the unit circle, but now it's traversed twice as fast, twice as fast. So remember from trigonometry, when you alter this coefficient of the input, it changes the speed at which you wrap around the circle. So here, because this coefficient, actually I'll say this, remember these are inside the cosine and sine functions. So changing this coefficient changes the speed at which you travel around the circle. In this case, because it's a two, it's going to travel around the circle twice as fast. So that means it'll make two rounds around the circle in this time. So as t goes from 0 to 2 pi, our point is going to go around once and then twice because it's going to go twice as fast. All right. So good news. 
that's it for all the theory. Now we're just going to get to see a whole bunch of really, really cool examples. So I'm going to pull up Desmos here. You are more than welcome to pull this up on your own. I encourage you to and just to mess around with these things. But let me get this pulled up. Okay, there's that. All right, and let me pull up the Desmos example right here. Cool. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is the fast circle. So the fast circle is the one we just saw. So remember the parametric equations were cosine 2t and sine 2t. Uh, this little bit over here just tells us um, uh, this tells us where to stop drawing the curve. So I've got some extra code in here. Uh, this is actually just the actual point. So don't pay too much attention to this piece. This just labels the point. So here we go. Here's the fast circle. I'm going to zoom in a bit here. So here we start at one at the point one comma zero. So when t is equal to zero, this is where we start. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to vary a. Ooh, let me move this up for just a minute. Here we go. I'm going to vary a. So as a increases, this traces out a circle, and boop. So notice it traversed the circle once in about pi, right? When t is equal to pi, we've gone around once already because we went around twice as fast. Then as t increases, it keeps going around and around and around and around and around and around the circle. So this is just a fast circle described by these parametric equations, cosine 2t, sine 2t. All right, now let's look at something cute. This is a, what I call a periodic parabola. So here are the, here are the parametric equations for it. Uh, sine of t is the x-coordinate, and sine squared of t is the y-coordinate. So before I show you the picture and what it looks like, actually, you know what? I'll show you the picture first. Watch. Let's vary the parameter here. Ooh, goes up. Bink. Ah. Goes up. Bink. Comes back down. Bink. Bink, bink, and goes back and forth, back and forth, right? Let me go back to the beginning here. <laughs> so we start here at the origin, 0, 0, because sine of 0 is 0, so we get 0, 0. Up we go, bink, bink, and then it keeps going back and forth. It's a periodic parabola, periodic parabola. Now, what I was going to say a moment ago before I showed this was, look at the behavior in the horizontal direction and look at the behavior in the vertical direction. So here, the behavior in the horizontal direction is given by sine. So what you're going to get is you're going to get a back and forth. You're going to get an oscillation in the horizontal behavior, back and forth and back and forth. In the vertical direction, you're going to get a back and forth as well, given by sine. But because sine is squared, you're also going to get parabolic behavior. So this, this behavior right here is saying go up and down but in a in a parabolic way so that's why we get we get oscillation horizontally and we get oscillation vertically but we also get a, a vertical parabola parabolic behavior vertically all right cool stuff okay so that's a periodic parabola now let's look at um what's called a lisa ju curve here it is oh that's not it sorry don't look yet let me hide this there we go. All right, so this point starts at the origin, and I'm going to let the parameter vary. Oh, let's look at the formulas. So here are the formulas. 4 sine 4t, 3 sine 3t. Let's see what we get. Oh, I need more space. Ooh, there we go. Uh, one of my students in the past said this looks kind of like that symbol for an atom back from like the 50s, right? <laughs> But this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. So starting over at the beginning, it comes and swoops, swoops, swoops. All right, and then it repeats. So in this case, it actually uh, it's got a it's got another kind of a period. It basically gets to a point where it just repeats the same curve. There you go, Lisa Ju curve. All right, moving on. How about another curve? Let's see what this one is. Oof. Okay, so this one, the x-coordinate is given by cosine t times 1 minus cosine t, and the y-coordinate is given by sine t 
times one minus sine t. So what does this look like? Pull this down just a bit. Here we go. Oh, little loop there, and then a big swoop. And then it repeats. I'll zoom in a bit. All right, let's try that again. So we get a tiny little curve right there, boop, and then it comes back and gives a nice big wide curve right there, and then swoops back. And there you go, and then it repeats. Cute. All right, let's try another curve too. Oh, oh, this one, I, I like this one a lot. This one's really cool. Okay, this one, wait, I did one, let's do two. Okay, so look at this one for a minute. It's a, uh, it's it's t plus sine five t and t plus sine six t. So the a is basically letting me, uh, a is is or I should say this. T is the parameter. Now, how do I say this? A is the parameter here, but um, the reason that I have a and t separated is so that it will actually trace the curve out as I change this this variable here. That's why, that's why the formula looks like this. That's why the formula looks like this. Um, yeah, that, that's it. So check out this curve. Oh, I suppose I should actually turn it on. There we go. Now let's look at this curve. So we start at the origin and then we go like this. Ooh, whoa, 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 where is it going? Got to zoom out, whoa. Whoa, whoa, it's still going? Here, let me pull out this way a little bit. Oh, there we go. That's a cute little thing. Almost looks like a signature, right? Almost looks like a signature. Let me do it all over again. Let's go down here to zero. Starting at zero, zero, we got nothing. But then, shoo, little sketch, little trace. Here it comes, tracing around. Oh, and then it keeps going. So some cool things to notice. For one, notice it's got a periodicity. That makes sense because signs and signs are involved. So you're going to have a periodicity. So the curve kind of repeats from here, here. This looks like the period right here from this little loop to this loop. And then it repeats this loop to this loop, this loop to this loop. Another cool thing is this. Uh, the T, this is what's giving you that diagonal component. So the T's right here. Are giving you the diagonal component because uh, this is just the equation of the line y equals x, right? So y equals x is giving you this diagonal component, and then it's the sine function that's giving you all of the variability. It's the sine function that's giving you the oscillation. And because the periods of the sine functions are different, that's why we're not getting uniformity in both ways. We're getting a bunch of little variations here. Uh, one of the reasons I think that this is kind of cool is because um, there's a show called Spidey and His Amazing Friends, and I noticed that the the it's it's Spider Man basically, right? And the webs that they shoot out, the webs that they shoot out, the animation that they use in the cartoon is a straight line, and then wrapped around that straight line is basically something that looks like this. So it was clear to me when I was watching the show that the animators basically used a function similar to this to design the look of the webs that get shot out. Like literally the webs that get shot out when they get shot out. It's like a straight line with this wrapped around it. So that's kind of cool. All right, like I said, a bunch of pretty pictures. Okay, let me wrap this one back down. Okay, another curve. Here's another curve, here we go. What does this one look like? Oh, that's an interesting one. Bouncing around, looks like a bunch of triangles. Uh, you know, the other thing that these curves remind me of is a, a toy called a spirograph. So if you've ever used a spirograph or any kind of toy where you had a bunch of like interlocking gears and you would put a pencil in it and then you just had to like let your pencil follow the gear pattern, that's how they make the that's how they make those toys. That's how they design those toys. They basically figure out these parameters and make the gears and then you get the toy, so it's kind of cool. All right, that's a cool one. What about this one? Whoa, whoa, okay, let's let's look at how that one's generated. Let me pull this down too. All right, here we go. So this one 
Ooh, complicated, complicated expressions, right? So this is just the X coordinate. This gives us the X coordinate right here. And then the Y coordinate is something similar over here. Yeah, okay, there we go. Now, as it traces out, you get that, and then it repeats. And then it repeats. There we go. Oh, my slides are starting to freak out on my other screen here. Anyway, that's what it looks like. So it, this one really looks like a spirograph. So if you've ever seen one of those, you've probably drawn a lot of pictures like that. Okay, now let's do the cycloid. So the cycloid is actually an important curve. Uh, the cycloid is, oops, let me hide this. The cycloid is the curve that is traced out when you pick a point on the circle and then follow that point as the circle rolls. So a perfect, a perfect example is if you ever rode your bike through a puddle. So when you ride your bike through a puddle, you get some water on one part of your wheel. And then as your wheel rolls along, it's like a little water spot keeps popping up and going bink, bink, bink. That's called a cycloid. Here's what it looks like. Bink, bink, need more space. <laughs> think like that. All right, so the green circle is the bicycle wheel. And then this little orange dot is the tiny puddle that you just ran over. And so as your bicycle wheel rolls along, that little wet spot on the wheel moves like this through space. There it is. So that's called a cycloid. Um, this curve right here is called the cycloid. This curve is actually extremely important because it is the solution to the uh, the brachistochrone problem and the totochrone problem. And I'll let you all look that up. Um, but it's basically the curve that gives you the, the curve of fastest descent under the force of gravity. It's also the curve where uh, if you drop an object from any point on the curve, or sorry, if you drop <laughs> different objects from different points on the curve, they will all reach the bottom of the curve at the same time. So that's an interesting result, but you can look it up, brachistochrone and totochrone. Physicist, you'll learn all about that stuff later too. Okay, that's the cycloid. Now let's go back and look at one other curve. Uh, these types of curves are actually, there's two parameters. These ones are called conchoid, conchoids of Nicomedes. So let me do this. Uh, there's two parameters. There's B and A, or you can think of it as like T and S. So B, I'm gonna leave here. Let's see what happens as I change A. Oops. Okay, so as I change A, the curve gets traced out like so. And then it repeats. So these are interesting because these curves have asymptotes. They've got asymptotes because tangent is involved. Remember, tangent is an asymptotic function. It's got tangents at, at every, uh, what is it? Um, uh, integer multiple of pi over two, right? So you're getting integer multiple? No, odd integer multiple of pi over two. You're getting a, a, an asymptote. Now look what happens when I change B. So B kind of changes the eccentricity, but look if I put B near negative two, or negative one, sorry, negative one, we get a little cusp. We get a cusp at the origin. Zoom back out here. All right. Then as I move B along, I get a little loop. I get a little loop. And then right here, this is kind of interesting. When B is equal to zero, we just get the circle. We get the unit circle. The reason is because when B is zero, you don't have this tangent factor anymore. Tangent's just gone. And what you're left with is um, cosine, alpha, or cosine and sine, which is the unit circle, all right? So here's another one that's kind of fun to play with. Like, when do you get those loops? Under what conditions do you get those loops? And they kind of move along. Okay, so I think I'll leave it at that. Um, let me go back to the slides for a minute here. All right, there we go. Okay, so those are the, the Desmos examples. I encourage you to just play around with them. Remember, you can, you can go to this link, you can play, move them around, change the parameters, change the variables, see what happens, have fun. But on that note, let's play, <laughs> let's play. So once again, thank you for bearing with me. I'm glad this one wasn't nearly as long as the last one. And I hope you enjoyed the very pretty pictures that were involved. And I hope you create other very pretty pictures. 
this is really just scratching the surface. There are lots and lots of these pretty pictures. All right, so I'll end there and thank you all very much. I'll see you next time.